Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show here. This is episode 18 of Forensics Talk. So uh, welcome you all here today. Uh, just before we get started, we're gonna have just a few quick announcements. And uh, let me just bring something up here. Just to let you know, next week is photogrammetry week. So I'm gonna be hosting a series of three free webinars from January 26th to the 28th. And uh, if you're interested in attending, uh, you wanna sign up, this is free. Um, information on how you can use photogrammetry in your field or in your discipline, by all means, please sign up there. Uh, you just go to ai2-3d.com and register. Also, there's some other things coming up, uh, some conferences. And if you are interested, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences is having a uh, virtual conference from February 15th to the 19th, 2021. That's just around the corner. So if you want to, you can just go to their website and sign up for that. Also, the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction is going to be having their conference. Uh, this is an in-person and virtual conference. And so you have a choice uh, if you like, and that's gonna be from March 2nd to 4th, and that's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, other than that, I think that's uh, what we need right here. And I'm gonna get started with the introduction for our next guest. All right. Uh, would you please welcome me in, in join? Uh, would you please welcome me? I can't speak today. I don't know what's going on. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Harry Millman. He's a PhD and he's a consulting pharmacologist, toxicologist, and expert witness with over 40 years of experience at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of Health and the U.S. Public Health Service. Uh, Dr. Millman has assisted in over 300 civil criminal cases uh, civil and criminal cases, high profile legal cases, and has testified at trials and depositions. He's authored over 70 scientific articles and has edited five science books, including the highly acclaimed Handbook of Carcinogen Testing, and he's often quoted in newspapers and magazines. Dr. Millman appeared as a toxicology expert on the History Channel, the Oxygen Channel, TV and radio news programs, and in true crime television shows. And Dr. Millman is the author of two novels, A Death at Camp David, winner of the Best Mystery Novel in the 2018 Book Talk Radio Club Awards, and Soyuz, The Final Flight, uh, a finalist for Best Second Novel in the 2018 Next Generation Indie Books Awards. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about his third book, his latest book, which is Forensics, The Science Behind the Deaths of Famous People, right here, and I finished it, and I've got my notes here. Um, so we're gonna be asking him a whole bunch of questions. Uh, let me see, let me bring him in here. Dr. Milman, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. All right, great. Well, uh, I want to start at the beginning, and I'd like to ask you about when you were, uh, well, before you were doing what you're doing now, and uh, what started you thinking about toxicology, and when did you make that jump? So that's uh, a, a very long uh, question, and I'll uh, try to uh, phrase it as quickly as I can, but um, I know you have many students uh, who are uh, listening and watching today, so uh, just want to let you know, when I was in high school, I uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I was very good in math. I thought I was going to be an electrical engineer. Uh, but for various reasons, my parents decided that I should go into pharmacy. And, uh, and of course, pharmacy is, is a lot of sciences and a lot of biological sciences, chemistry, I did five years of uh, pharmacy school in New York City, uh, Columbia University. And uh, during that time period, I also worked uh, in a drugstore at the same time, about 17, 18 hours a week. And that kind of gave me the idea that I really wasn't interested in doing uh, pharmacy as a uh, career path. Uh, nevertheless, I finished pharmacy school, uh, got my bachelor's in pharmacy in 1966. And then I did a master's in pharmaceutics for two years, 1968. <clears throat> By the time I, I uh, finished my master's, uh, that was a, uh, since it was a master's, there was a thesis involved and in some research. And, and that, gave me, <clears throat> that, that gave me the idea that I liked to do research, laboratory research. So I was very interested in getting into a uh, laboratory uh, research environment and, uh, and perhaps even getting a PhD. So <clears throat> this was 1968, uh, very difficult to get uh, jobs at the time. So I joined the United States Public Health Service. That's a uniformed service. Um, 
And I basically, I stayed with the public health service for 30 years. My first assignment uh, was an Indian reservation, an Indian reservation in Minnesota as the first pharmacist on the reservation uh, where I, I was there for two years. But during those two years, like I, like I said, I was very interested in research. So I was constantly applying to the National Cancer Institute to see if I can get a job at the uh, National Cancer Institute in, in a laboratory. And two years later, I was lucky enough to be able to get a job uh, as a uh, research scientist, um, a junior scientist in the laboratory of toxicology. And um, that was at the Cancer Institute. So we did a lot of research on uh, anti-cancer drugs, uh, potential uh, new and novel cancer drugs, and uh, it was a combination of biochemistry, pharmacology, and toxicology work. And uh, while working at the laboratory, my boss at the time uh, thought I should go on for a PhD program. And, uh, and uh, this is all in, in the Washington DC area, and there are very good universities nearby. And, and, uh, and so the National Cancer Institute supported me to go to the George Washington University where I got my PhD over there in pharmacology uh, and did my thesis on the job. And uh, lucky for me, the, the National Institutes of Health paid for my schooling. And so I uh, was able to get the uh, practical experience and the PhD program at the same time. And, uh, and of course, uh, it was a very, uh, very busy uh, uh, laboratory. So I, so I got many scientific papers and uh, so by the time I finished my uh, PhD program, I then uh, joined a different program at the Cancer Institute for three more years. And after 10 years at the Cancer Institute, I joined the Environmental Protection Agency, where I was there for 18 years as a uh, regulatory toxicologist, senior science adv advisor. And, um, and now after a 30 year career in the, in the public health service, uh, I came out after 30 years in 1998 as a uh, toxicology and cancer expert, uh, five scientific books, many scientific papers, and lots of experience in toxicology uh, and and cancer, carcinogenesis, which is causes of cancer. And uh, now when I retired in 1998, the question is, what am I gonna do now? And, uh, and so somebody recommended me to assist uh, a, a public relations firm as a scientist, uh, they had clients who were in the chemical industry, they needed somebody who understood the science and be able to communicate that in a reasonable way. And which, so I did that for a couple of years, during which time I was also involved in my local society, the Society of Toxicology. And uh, by coincidence, uh, two years after I retired from the public health service, uh, somebody called me up that I was working with in the society and they, uh, they had a sideline of uh, providing expert witnesses to uh, public defender's offices. And there was this case in Alabama that uh, the expert uh, reneged at the last minute. And now the, uh, the trial was in two weeks. <clears throat> and, and this person thought that I would be very good for as an expert. You know, they, they've worked with me. So they thought I would be very good as an expert in that case. Mm -hmm. and, and that case, uh, uh, I will stop in a minute. That case basically uh, involved, it was a rape trial and the fellow, uh, his defense was um, that he took the whole bottle of Viagra, tried to commit suicide and basically Viagra made me do it, was his defense. And the, uh, uh, the uh, attorney wanted me to come up with a, a hypothesis why Viagra might cause aggressive behavior. Okay. <laughs> so, I can go on, I can go on, but I'll let you ask some questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you about that. So hold on to that. So for the people that are watching here now, there, there's there's stuff on Viagra in this in this episode um, that I didn't realize until I didn't discover until last night. So I'm definitely gonna ask you. Um, so yeah, one of the things I was wondering when I was uh, sort of researching about you know the work that you've done is that you have a ton of research and so now i understand why because you, you sort of had the opportunity in the lab to do a lot of that work um can you tell me sort of on, on a fundamental level what are some of the major differences between pharmacology and toxicology so uh, pharmacology is is uh, basically uh, how drugs work the mechanism of drug action um toxicology is the uh 
well, the toxic or the adverse effects of either drugs or chemicals. Um, th these two disciplines are very similar in the sense that they both study the uh, absorption, distribution, and elimination of drugs. And of course, drugs are also chemicals. So um, toxicology also used uh, examines industrial chemicals, but they basically look at absorption, distribution, and elimination of uh, chemicals or drugs. Um, pharm pharmacology does that in the therapeutic range. Toxicology does that in the in the overdose range or in the toxic range. So the differences basically are just the dose the dose response curve, uh, uh, therapeutic versus toxic range or overdose. But the uh, me mechanics, if you will, of the mechanisms are pretty much the same: absorption, distribution, and elimination, metabolism. Mm -hmm. So over your, I mean, over the years, have you seen? Um... I'm assuming that you've done more as a toxicologist. Uh, would that be fair to say or no? Uh, it's a combination. Um, when I worked in the laboratory, it was uh, pharmacology and toxicology. Uh, in my regulatory, it's mostly toxicology. And as an expert witness, which we'll get into, it's, uh, it's a combination of both. Okay. Well, I'm, and it might be a good point. We can, we can try to get into that. Um, what would you say is the most important contribution of toxicology to forensics or the overall forensics investigation? So for forensics primarily involve, if we, if we just talk about the biological forensics as opposed to any other uh, field of forensics, um, forensics basically is, is concerned with toxicology because pharmacology is uh, taking drugs at therapeutic range. And uh, if you take a single drug at a therapeutic range, you're not gonna have any major toxicities. Uh, if you take a combination of drugs that are each in the therapeutic range, but have the same pharmacological action, for example, they're all sedatives, then, then the combined effect uh, becomes toxic and now you get into toxicology. So there's a relationship between these two disciplines, pharmacology and toxicology. Uh, but, but basically we're looking at the toxic range in, in litigation as opposed to the uh, therapeutic range. Yeah, I don't have the statistic, but I'm just, I was just wondering or imagining, you know, of all the different cases, uh, criminal cases that are out there, how many of them or what percentage of them deal with, you know, some combination of, you know, whether it's even if it's a, if it's a shooting or some other type of event, that involve, you know, someone under the influence of alcohol or or, or opioids or, or some other illicit drug or something like that. And I would I would guess that it's a f substantial or significant amount. But I, I I'm now curious about what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so I, I can't tell you about statistics, but I will tell you that the cases that I I'm involved with, uh, where, um, for example, there was a uh, a, a uh, auto accident and somebody died, and there's usually, at least the cases I'm involved with, usually there's uh, drugs or alcohol involved, and, and those will be in the toxic range. Um, so, and, 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 and sometimes I'm also involved with illicit drugs. So, uh, so um, but I can't tell you, um, you know, other criminal cases like shootings or stabbings, for example, if there are any drugs involved, in those kind of cases, mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some in some cases, but I can't tell you the statistics. Yeah, it's uh, you know it, I'm just in reading your book, and I know we're going to get to it, but you know one of the things that came to mind was, um, well, I, just how many people are on medication these days, and um, maybe how many people might be abusing it as well, and I'm I'm not sure. Uh, well, well, we'll get to that I think when we get to the book, but let me ask you this: um, as a as an expert, a toxicologist and a, an expert witness, um, what are some of the things that um, you have learned as an expert witness over the years and a toxicologist being on the stand? Uh, just any comments on that? So um, I, I told you my first case was that Viagra case. And as it turns out, I did a lot of research for the case. I only had two weeks. Um, I was all ready to appear on the stand uh, but the other side, uh, 
the, the other side uh, petitioned the judge not to allow me to testify because I was a last minute replacement. They didn't have a chance to uh, evaluate me. So, so I never testified, but, but I, uh, and, and, and the fellow uh, was found guilty because he didn't have a defense, but I took my, uh, my, my, my hypothesis, basically what I did was I reviewed the scientific literature and came up with a hypothesis why, why Viagra could cause aggressive behavior under certain circumstances. And I took my whole hypothesis and then I published it. And, and subsequent to that, I, I, uh, I, I found a, uh, an expert, I'm sorry, I found a, a scientist over at Ohio State University who had, uh, who had methods for measure, for identifying uh, aggressive behavior in rats, and I and between the two of us, we collaborated on on testing Viagra in his system, and 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 we found that Viagra does cause aggressive behavior under certain circumstances, and we published that. Well, make a long story short, I enjoyed that whole experience, uh, and so I, I set up a website, and, and subsequent to that, I I got picked up by attorneys all over the country. Um, now, so my my case is basically all deal with drugs or chemicals in one form or another. And I assist in four areas, toxicology, pharmacology, carcinogenesis, which is causes of can chemical causes of cancer, as well as pharmacy errors. And, uh, and in one form or another, there's usually co a combination of a, a couple of these disciplines in each case. So, and I also assist defense and plaintiff. So I'm a, and I'm about 50-50. And, and, and over the time, I, I've assisted in about 325 cases or thereabout. But, but most of them, are, I would say about 90% are civil cases. About 10% or so are, are criminal cases. And criminal cases tend to go to trial. Civil cases generally do not. So I would say about 90% of my cases settle before court. Mm -hmm. About 10% actually go to trial. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, um, in terms of the, the type of cases that you're working on, have you seen a trend over the years where, you know, you're working on these types of cases and then there's a new drug and it's this type of case and now it's this type or, you know, what kind of trends have you seen over the years in terms of either the kinds of drugs that are on the market or the, or the types of cases that you've been working on? Yeah. So the, the, the trend that I tend to see, so obviously I'm at the mercy of the attorney, uh, which attorney calls me uh as to the case whether it's on the plaintiff side or the defense side but generally speaking and what i find what i find is that i get more phone calls when there's a for example a toxic effect of a given drug up in the news and all of a sudden i get phone calls from attorneys who, who want to sue uh people who you know when people uh, are using that drug and and might get some toxic problem and so now they want to sue, sue the manufacturers and um, and generally speaking, um, generally speaking, the cases tend to be against um, people who have money, if you will. So that, that is to say, uh, it, you know, it might be a doctor because there's a, an insurance company standing right. behind him, or a hospital, uh, or a chemical company. But individuals who, who don't have much money, uh, based in it's. It, for attorneys, it's it's a business, and if they can't any make any money in a civil case, they are probably not going to take the case. Yeah. So, so most of the cases tend to be uh, where there's either an insurance company behind them, or a chemical company, or somebody who has a lot of money. So I'm curious about. Um, so if you're on the stand and you know you're getting a a, a defense lawyer or whatever uh, that's asking you questions, what do they typically hit a toxicologist with? I mean, you're fairly well educated and everything else, and you have a lot of experience, but um, you know, what, what kinds of things are they going to go after you for? So uh, that's, that's a very good question. So, so here I am and, and, and I tell you all your viewers out there who are interested in being a, uh, uh, an expert witness. So people ask me, how do you become an expert witness? And I tell them first, you become a, a, an expert and then you can become an, an expert witness. Uh, and to be an expert, uh, in my case, I have more than 40 years worth of experience and, and, I, and I told you about that. Um, but despite the fact that I went to 14 years of college and despite the fact that I ha have all this experience, these oppos opposing attorneys all, always find something 
on which to hang their hat on and complain about about you. So for example, um, I'm a toxicologist, um, but I'm not a medical doctor. So they might, so even though I went 14 years to college, have all these books and, and scientific papers and toxicology and pharmacology, nevertheless, they say, well, you're not a medical doctor, are you? Uh, and I say, no. And they say, well, how can you speak about cause of death when you're not an MD? Only an MD can talk about cause of death. So that, that's one example where they basically try to pick on you, no matter how much experience you have. Uh, and, and, and to be an expert witness, one, I, I, I try to, uh, to anticipate the questions beforehand, so I'm ready with responses. Uh, I, I can't always do that, but I try to anticipate. And the way I do that is not only based on the information that I have reviewed already, but many times before, before the trial, I, I received copies of the transcripts of other experts, uh, transcripts from depositions, I should say, which I held before the trial, of other experts, either, either medical experts or experts by the other side. I get copies of their transcripts. I can see the kind of questions that they were asked. And theoretically, I might be asked the same kind of questions. So I try to anticipate the questions and, uh, and you can't have a thin skin when you understand because, like I said, they pick on you, and no matter what you say, they'll always find something wrong with you. Uh, you know, just uh, just to give you an example, um, uh, in a recent case, uh, a recent case that dealt with um, it was it was a vehicular homicide case, and it, and I I was assisting the driver. I was on the uh, defense side and the uh, driver fell asleep at the wheel and as a result hit a car and somebody died and um and that that driver that i was assisting aside from having a couple of of drugs in their system in the therapeutic range mind you like methadone for example they were i will say that that person was uh being treated for drug addiction with methadone so that they had methadone at therapeutic range in the at the dose that was prescribed so it wasn't an overdose or anything so they had you know it was therapeutic drugs that they had in their system uh which of course have side effects even though the therapeutic range and but but aside from that they all they were also hypothyroid and, you know hypothyroid makes you and they were very fatigued fatigued and the thing is that they didn't know that they were hypothyroid, but they went to the doctor a couple of days before the accident and the doctor suspected, so he took blood work, but the results weren't in yet. Mm -hmm. So later we find out that they were, you know, it, it was, they were extremely hypothyroid. Well, hypothyroid makes you very fatigued, you know, and I wrote in my report that, um, that the, the person fell asleep at the wheel because uh, the, you know they were hypothyroid and they were uh, they were sedated, sedated, and they said, and I and I had various references, and they uh, they went through my references and they said, well, show me where the word sedation is in that reference, and uh, the word that they had was fatigue, but it doesn't require you know uh, a rocket scientist to go from fatigue that you might fall asleep, you know, but but they picked on that, that yeah. the word sedation is not in any of these uh, references that you, so how can you say that they were sedated? And, uh, and th that's, that's one example of some of the problems that you tend to run into. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay. So this is the part where I've been dreading because um, even in your book or whatever, there are all these chemicals and I've realized I can't pronounce half of them properly. So I'm going to, I'm going to, just, yeah, I'm not going to do a good job here, but let me ask you some questions on some of the other research. Um, it's asparagine. Is that the way you say it? Asparagine. Yes, yes. Okay. You've done a ton of work on asparagine. What is it and what is the importance? <clears throat> so I was, like I said, I was in the laboratory toxicology and, uh, and our laboratory uh, primarily was involved with uh, looking at, looking at, uh, at a drug that affects asparagine is an amino acid. So it looks at a drug that affects the level of asparagine, this amino acid, in certain leukemias. And by, 
by, re, by eliminating or reducing asparagine to, which has a, because it has an N, it's because it's not for nitrogen in it. So it takes away the nitrogen and goes from asparagine to aspartic acid, the same thing, but without the nitrogen. And, uh, and, and that in turn kills the tumor. Okay, but, but the, enzy the enzyme asparaginase uh, converts asparagine to aspartic acid, takes away the, the uh, amine uh, part of the asparagine and, and, uh, and so the, the tumor can't grow in, in its absence. Okay. With, with time, with, you know, you, you keep giving it, so with time, uh, the tumor becomes uh, resistant to asparaginase and it becomes resistant because it makes its own asparagine. Okay. So, right. so we were studying the uh, the amino acid. The interesting thing about the whole thing is that um, about that whole scenario is the fact that on the one hand we were studying it in, as far as tumors are concerned, but on the other hand, uh, one day I, I I looked to see part part of my study was to see uh, where else do you find asparagine synthetase, the enzyme that makes asparagine. Where do you find it in the normal body? you know, in normal organs of the body. So I examined all the, uh, nearly all the organs of a mouse and I found that it's the highest concentration in the pancreas, something that has never been found before. And now the, the, the point is that if you give us an enzyme to inhibit asparagine synthetase in tumor, it, it'll go all over the body and also inhibit the enzyme in the pancreas and that may cause toxicities. Okay. That basically led to my thesis uh, for my PhD program. Oh, great, cool. Um, what about the work that you've been doing on endocrine disruptors? So what can you tell us about that? So so and endocrine disruptors was after I was already out of the lab. Uh, I was over at the uh, National, uh, I'm sorry, the Environmental Protection Agency. And at that time, uh, you know, endocrine disruption was just beginning uh, to be uh, recognized as an issue and bisphenol A Bisphenol A, which is found in, in it's a chemical, found, a very ubiquitous chemical found in many um, plastics and tubings. And, uh, and, and when we talk about plastics, then we're concerned about baby bottles and even, even, uh, uh, even uh, medical uh, tubings that are used in, uh, in uh, blood transfusions or things like that, or, or transfusion bags, anything to do with plastics. So that was the, uh, so basically at the time we, we reviewed all the toxicology related to um, bisphenol A uh, in, um, in, in, as, a, as an endocrine disruptor. Okay, oh, neat. Um, let me ask you a question about, I uh, just because you know, we're talking about COVID and, and people are talking about the vaccines and coming out. And uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, uh, the Pfizer, uh, vaccine and it's uh sort of how it's formulated or and what's it about and you know whether you can say anything about you know if it is it safe or, or what are your thoughts on that so uh in the well, other let, me, let, let me ask it this way what's different about the pfizer than a traditional vaccine yeah the traditional vaccine for example um involves <clears throat> injecting what is known as attenuated virus. Now it's taking the virus and making it um, ineffective and but but then you got you still have the complete virus even though it's ineffective and harmless if you will but they inject that so that this way the body sees this foreign object and its system will make antibodies towards it. Um, with the COVID uh, vaccine there is no virus that's being injected, attenuated or otherwise. So, so there's no biological substance like that that is being injected into these into your arm. So, the, what they what they what they did was um, basically they identified that there's a certain what they call an S S protein, S for Sam S protein, on the virus on the COVID virus. So uh, and so they. They, what they're injecting is a messenger RNA, which is a, uh, a, uh, a substance that helps in the translation of information from the DNA to into making proteins. So they inject messenger RNA that's specific for the S protein 
that is found on the on the COVID virus. So that's what they're injecting. And as a result, your body makes antibodies to this protein. Um, and, th and then subsequently, it, it will have sufficient uh, antibody that if it sees the uh, COVID, if you get infected with COVID, uh, well, the antibody is already present and, and will be able to fight it. So, so it's not an injection of a, of a virus, it's just an injection of, a, of an RNA, which helps the body makes antibodies towards a protein, which eventually, if, if you get infected, it will see. Okay. Now, I think there are people working on different types of like traditional vaccines for COVID though. And I, I, I don't recall them all, but some are like, for example, a dead form of the virus. Some are where you have like a carrier virus, like where they take a, an animal virus or an insect virus. Well, I'm, I'm sure they are. They, uh, they work on different types of, of uh, vaccines as well as treatment. Uh, in fact, I just heard something today about possible treatment. Okay. Oh, interesting. Well, look, I, I want to switch here a little bit um, because uh, I want to talk about your writing. Uh, so the first question is, um, when did you first decide that you were going to write a book and what prompted you to do so? So as I mentioned, I, uh, you know, I read a lot of autopsy reports, police reports. I've been doing uh, expert witness work for more than 20 years now. <clears throat> and uh, and about seven years ago, uh, I came up with the idea of a story, which eventually became A Death at Camp David, my first novel. And, um, and, and, and it, was, it revolved around a, the main character, uh, as, you, as you can imagine, was a forensic toxicologist, an expert witness. So this way I can take my whole background and experience and put it into the main character. And so that was my first novel, and I worked on it for about two and a half years. Uh, it took me two and a half years to publish it. Uh, I thought it was going to be my last one because it took so long. It was a lot of work. I also have uh, my expert witness work, so I don't have that much time. But I had my first book signing event uh, at Barnes & Noble in, in, in right here in Rockville, Maryland. And uh, for one, I sold out, so that was you know, a very nice feeling. And two, I met a lot of people who, who, who liked the book and they asked me, they asked me, well, what, what's your next one about? And, and I wasn't planning on doing a next one. And they said, well, you can't just write one, you got to write a sequel. And so now <laughs> I, and I, I decided, well, let me, let me see if I can think of something else. And um, so over time, I had 175 book signing events at Barnes and Noble over two to three years, and uh, and that's for for my first two novels, and uh, and nearly all of them sold out at, at each event. So I like that experience. I like meeting people. Um, when I came, when the idea came for writing a second novel, uh, I, I didn't know what I was going to do, um, but a friend of mine at that time, the uh, the. The, the novel and then the movie came out for um, for the Mar the Martian with Matt Damon if, if everybody remembers that yeah yeah and, uh, and so my friend told me well the Martian started off as a self published book just like mine and and um, and then it was picked up to be made into a movie so so I, I read the Martian and that gave me and I saw that in his case. He also had science, but his science was botany. And, and then I thought, well, if I can come up with uh, things in space, uh, things that happen in space that are toxicology related, then maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I, I can write, which, and I did, uh, Soyuz, The Final Flight. And basically what, what, what the book is about is about sabotage on the International Space Station. And a lot of things happen on, on the space station as well as on the Soyuz, which is the Russian spacecraft that was taking American astronauts to the space station until recently. And uh, I came up with a number of different toxicology related problems that occur along the way. And that, that's how I got my second novel. I, okay. And, and if you want, I'll, I'll get into my my current book. Well, that's what I'm just going to ask you. So this one right here, that's the third one. It's the science behind the deaths of famous people right here. So I, I finished, uh, you know, I just finished it last night. 
and uh, there, there's some things I'm going to ask you about. But by all means, please uh, go ahead and, and talk about what prompted you to, to jump into this particular one and what's different about this one versus the other ones. The other ones were, were fiction. Right. So, so the other two were uh, basically mystery novels. So one was uh, Camp David, another one was in space. <clears throat> they both had the same uh, main character, an expert witness, uh, tox a forensic toxicologist. And uh, now for my third one, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to write. One one option, which I which I I started writing but didn't finish yet, is uh, called uh, Murder at the Taj Mahal, which again was a novel, uh, the same expert witness as the uh, main character. But after I started writing that, uh, then one day I heard that Carrie Fisher died, and uh, if you all recall, Carrie Fisher died. Uh, she she got sick aboard an airplane on the flight from London to Los Angeles. And Carrie Fisher was known to uh, abuse uh, illicit drugs. And so I for sure thought that she died from a drug overdose. And then when I read the reports, I, I saw that, uh, that the coroner determined that her cause of death was sleep apnea, uh, not an overdose. And, and not only that, uh, that the family had refused to give the, the coroner permission to do uh, an autopsy, a standard autopsy. So now my uh, my curiosity was piqued because I, I never heard of sleep apnea as the cause of death. Sleep apnea is where a person uh, temporarily stops breathing for a few seconds. This is something that she she had experienced for some time. And so it's, it, it usually doesn't cause death. And uh, and uh, and here, besides that, there was no autopsy. So how can they do a? Uh, how can they conclude that that was the cause of death? So that got me thinking about the possibility of uh, you know of other uh, famous people. And and I, I researched, and and subsequent to that, that was the two years worth of research and writing on various other celebrities. And uh, and that's how my third book came out, a nonfiction right. book in this case that examines the science behind the death of 23 famous people. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to read off some of the names that you have here in that have been listed just so people are aware. So there's uh, Errol Flynn, Marilyn Monroe, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Elvis Presley, John Belushi, Karen Carpenter, Amy Winehouse, Whitney Houston, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, there was Robin Williams, Joan Rivers, Prince is a whole bunch here. So there's, there's plenty of different uh, people. And what was cool was too, is that they, they all have different factors. Um, let me let me ask you if you can comment on one part. I'm just going to read out of, out of the book here, and I've just put up the link here. If anybody's interested, you can just go and uh, forensicsfamouspeople.com, and uh, you can you can find some more information there. Um, so let me just read this one part, and maybe you can elaborate on it. Uh, you're talking about the aim of the book. It says, my aim was to demonstrate how forensics helps coroners determine that 51% or more of the evidence supports an opinion that death more likely than not was caused by drugs chemical toxicants or disease so as an ex so as an expert uh, witness I have to uh, when I testify I have to testify within a reasonable degree of scientific certainty and that means that the most of the evidence 51 percent or more of the evidence has to support my conclusion to say that it's it's more likely than not, for example, that the uh, drug overdose killed the, killed the person. 50% um, would be as likely as not. So I need 51% or more. Obviously, there's no way to really measure that, but, but it's looking at all the scientific information as well as the medical records, autopsy reports, police reports, if there are any, and clinical science to take all that information, synthesize it all into a plausible explanation that it's more likely than not that uh, this is what happened scientifically. Right. And, uh, and, and, and that's what we're talking about here in that statement. Yeah. Let, let me read another, uh, another uh, part in one of the conclusions here. It says, uh, in the United States, more than 30% of overdoses involve a combination of opioids and benzo, uh, benzodiazepines. And that was one thing that actually surprised me in the book was how many, uh, not so much how many people were uh, taking therapeutic medication, but how many 
they were taking at once. Uh, and it just seems like, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person I'm always, you know, I, I, I worry about taking an aspirin or something, right? So to see these people taking these, uh, these types of medications in, in large, you know, four or five different types, I just thought like, wow, like it's just, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, I don't know what the side effects would be. And I'm not sure if any medical doctor would be able to tell you what happens when you start combining four or more drugs. Uh, that is, yeah, that's, uh, the, obviously it's a huge problem, um, especially when all these different medications even, see, there's a misconception that if you're taking it at the therapeutic range, if you take five of them at the therapeutic range, it should not be a problem because each one is at the therapeutic range. But the fact is that if all five of them, for example, have the same pharmacological action, let's, let's say being they're all sedatives or sedatives and tranquilizers or a combination of different antidepressants, well, then, then that combined effect is, could not be toxic. And uh, because even though each one of them is at a low dose combined, it's a high dose. And, uh, and it, you know, and the depress and, and with those kind of drugs, basically the depress the respiratory system Obviously, they make you sleepy and tired, and and and, and perhaps even go, go into a coma. But it's respiratory depression, generally speaking, uh, or, or in other words, you stop breathing. Uh, that is the cause of death. Mm -hmm. Now, why do they take so many? I, I have no idea directly, but but my, you know, in, in, if I can just <laughs> if I can just speak to your to your viewers here a little bit. Uh, uh, personally, when I was much younger, uh, one of the things I did was, uh, aside from science and working, and I uh, I, I, I was a stand-up comic, uh, working with, uh, I was on the same stage as Bill Maher, for, you, for all of you who might know Bill Maher, uh, he, uh, politically incorrect. And this was before Bill Maher was the Bill Maher that we know today. So... Uh, he's, he, uh, he worked as a stand-up comic for 20 years and then became an overnight success. I, uh, I worked for a year or two, and then I, uh, I retired from comedy, if you will, and, and continued with my science background. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that when I had, I, I had the experience of being on stage, and now all these others, all these celebrities, they're on stage all the time for much longer than I was. And as a result, and I had that experience on a small scale. So the experience basically shows you that when you're on stage and, you, and you're hyper and you'll get all that adulation from the, from the audience. And by the time you finish your show, you are very, very hyper and very up and you can't fall asleep. Uh, so you have to give your body a chance to unwind. I know in my case, I also, I, I came home about 12, 1230, and it still took me about an hour before I could, I could fall asleep. Well, these, these uh, entertainers, you know, they have their shows and they might stay up all night. So, and yet they have to come back the next day and have another show. So at some point they look, they look for assistance and, if, and of course they have their own physicians who, who finds it difficult to, to say no. And, you know, they start with one medication and maybe that helps, but with time they become, they, they build up resistance. And so now either the dose has to be increased or else they add a second one. And before you know it, yeah, you, you know, you wind up in the overdose range. Yeah. Question, are there any drugs that are typically prescribed in combination? So that like two drugs, which are known to have a beneficial effect versus yeah, they used to be, they used to be uh, combination drugs packaged package together uh, where, you know, three different drugs are in one pill, if you will. At, at some point, maybe 20, 25 years ago or so, the Food and Drug Administration frowned upon that because, because exactly for these kind of points that each drug has its own side effects. Now, however, we, we still have a little bit of that whether some drugs, for example, are uh, some of the narcotic drugs might be combined with aspirin or, or Tylenol, uh, which is another painkiller, but of, of less potency. So you, you have some of that. I, I don't think you, you have any more, let's say, in the antibiotic range. Antibiotics, they, they tend to be se separate. Uh, a, physician can always, a physician can always prescribe two different drugs 
even though they're not combined, can prescribe two different drugs to be taken at the same time. But generally speaking, most drugs now are, are singular. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to give away too much in, in the book, but I will ask you if maybe you could pick uh, one or two of the celebrities that are in there or the people and maybe comment on, you know, the, the kinds of drugs they were using um, and, uh, you know, and just, just tell us maybe wh which one did you find most interesting in your research? <clears throat> Well, I already spoke. Well, let's talk. Let's talk about um, Carrie Fisher, uh, with, you know, who, who was basically uh, the reason for starting this book. Sure. Um, when, when so I, I already mentioned that they didn't do an autopsy, and uh, and I came up with I wrote in the book several reasons why that might have been so, which I'm not going to go into at the moment. But but as a result of that, so basically the family refused to an autopsy, which meant that not only couldn't they cut her up in an autopsy, but they could also couldn't take any blood or urine samples. And so that put a, the coroner at a disadvantage because uh, he didn't have any samples. So for the autopsy part, he, he did a CAT scan of the body. And realistically, the autopsy in general looks at anatomical changes. You know, was the heart enlarged? Was there any uh, occlusion of the arteries? Uh, do you have a large liver and that sort of thing? And some of those points can be seen in the CAT scan, not necessarily all of them. So he looked, he did a CAT scan, but for, but if he, and, and basically he didn't find anything unusual that would cause her death. So the next thing one looks at is the uh, toxicology uh, report. And of course, he, he couldn't take any blood or urine. So, so again, he was at a disadvantage. So what they did was instead, they took blood and urine sam samples that were left over from the hospital where she was at before she died. She died within a few days after, after being admitted to a hospital. So at that time, the hospital took some samples for their therapeutics uh, analysis, but then they had some some blood left over that was, was they could analyze for for chemicals and drugs, uh, but not enough. So, so they couldn't do all the tests. So again, uh, they, they found some, some level of drugs, but there wasn't enough uh, blood, for example, to do subsequent tests. So they couldn't get into a final conclusion on the, on the uh, toxicology issues. And so in the end, uh, but the, the coroner had to, had to con conclude on the cause of death and the manner of death. The cause of death, because he could, he uh, he couldn't conclude that it was a drug overdose or anything else, and there was no disease involved, so he concluded it was sleep apnea. On the matter of death, so the cause of death, just for your viewers, uh, it, that's all dependent on it's a bi a, the, a biological explanation for why a person died, which is based, you know, respiratory depression, a, a heart attack, or something of that nature. So so he basically came up with. Uh, sleep apnea. For the manner of death, that's a medical legal uh, interpretation of these circumstances surrounding the death, of which there are five categories. Um, there's uh, natural, homicide, suicide, accidental, and, um, and undetermined. So, so he, he couldn't determine which of these other four categories uh, was her was the manner of her death. It, it, it wasn't natural. It didn't seem to be natural. Um, and, and, but he couldn't, because he found some drugs in the system, but there wasn't enough information to, there wasn't enough blood to do further testing. So he couldn't call it natural. He couldn't call it a, hom a homicide or an, or an accident or a suicide, because again, there wasn't enough toxicology. And so he labeled it undetermined. So this is basically an example of, um, when you don't have all the evidence, you know, available for test for concluding, it's difficult to conclude on the manner of death and the cause of death. Um, and, and as a result, let's say Marilyn Monroe, for example, <clears throat> where they concluded uh, that her manner of death was a suicide, um, that's the area, even though the cause of death uh, is 
very specific in terms of mechanism of, of what happened, the biological mechanism, manner of death, since it's so nebulous, if you will, that's the area where conspiracy theories uh, originate. So in our case, uh, she was labeled a, a suicide, but people you know, came up with their conspiracy theories saying, no, that's wrong, it really was a homicide. And, uh, and I speak about it in the book, why they selected suicide as, their, as the manner of death. Okay. Yeah, I was just, so I was just thinking too, and, and again, it's just, it's, you know, it's not my area. So uh, maybe I'm, I'm hopefully going to ask the, the question correctly. And that is that um, for the types of drugs, which are being prescribed to these people, the, these famous people or whatever, um, what are the different classes of drugs? So, you know, some are maybe central nervous system depressants, and you talk about um, amphetamines, barbiturates, narcotics. So how, how would, what's the best way to group these? Yeah, so these are basically the stimulants or the presence of the central nervous system. So the amphetamines are stimulants or on the street, they call them uppers and the uh, depressants are downers, if you will. So they both affect the central nervous system, just the, they affect them in, you know, either stimulating or depressing. And obviously uh, they have, you know, they produce different types of pharmacological effects. Now, <clears throat> when you're into illicit drugs, uh, unfortunately, then uh, the, then they generally tend to be depressants, uh, like heroin, for example, which is a, a kind of a, a morphine type drug. Um, but sometimes the um, the Wait, the people you buy them from combine the heroin with, which is a depressant, along with a stimulant, uh, to uh, basically, to, to why they call it, uh, it's known as a speedball. And what they try to say is basically, when you combine the two, one of of one um, counteracts the pharmacologic effect of the other. So. Now, mind you, these are not people who who know science, and and as and and the buyers of these uh, drugs are not uh, are not scientists either. So it sounds it sounds good, but the fact is, um, first of all, it's not exactly correct because uh, because the counter effects of the two drugs is partly dependent on the the uh, the dose, you know, uh, how much you, how much you're getting, as well as the potency. Of, of the two different drugs. So one can outlast, one effect can outlast the other and then you can die from, and that's usually what happens. The depressant effects usually counteracts the stimulant effects. So uh, even though the stimulant effects is now dissipated, you're still left with the uh, depressant effects. And since you took a lot, you, you know, you can, you can get into the overdose and die. Right. So, so this is, this is all because uh, basically people don't really realize that uh, th that there's a lot that goes into the equation besides saying, oh, I'll take an, a stimulant along with a depressant in a speedball, for example, or, or, or some other drugs, you know? Right, right. Hey, uh, there's a couple of questions. I don't know if you'd mind taking a couple of questions from the, the comments here. Uh, one is from uh, Rafael Cunha. Uh, he's from Brazil, and he says, after a car crash death, is it possible that carbohydrates ingested by the driver can ferment internally and generate a conclusion in a report in which there was a presence of alcohol in the body? Well, <clears throat> for, for, first of all, fermentation takes a long time. So uh, so I'm, I, I don't think um, you, you, you would... Uh, you would use carbohydrate uh, intake as a defense mechanism for, or as a defense for your, <laughs> for your car accident, if you will. Um, plus, so one, it takes a long time. Secondly, you also have to have a lot of alcohol. Uh, in the United States, you have to be over the 0.08% range. And, and, and that could be, depending on the individual, could be approximately three, three glasses uh, three normal glasses, let's say, of wine. Um, so, you know, it, it also depends on the time, how, how, in what time period you, you, you drank that, those three glasses. 
but so that that's requires a lot of fermentation of a lot of carbohydrate that's not that would not be a good defense yeah yeah that makes sense to me um here's another one this is from uh, philip boyd from toronto and he says any comments on where dr millman thinks from pharma, uh, pharmacology or toxicology is going in the future post-mortem analysis harm reduction <clears throat> so the uh well you know the the field obviously is is evolving with time as you get as you learn more and more science <clears throat> Uh, first of all, there are different drugs, uh, uh, constantly new drugs that are being uh, uh, brought into the market. So, uh, and, and, and you learn about new toxicities uh, as, as a result of that. So, so that's what one issue that, you know, that occurs with time. Um, the, uh, I forget the rest of the question there, but- uh, let, me, let me bring it back up. <laughs> and, and about postmortem analysis. Um, the one issue about postmortem uh, with the drugs or alcohol for that matter, it's uh, postmortem is the time period after death. So usually, usually there's a time lag between the time the body was discovered until the autopsy is, is done. Sometimes it could be as short. I don't think I've seen ever seen less than three hours, but usually it's like overnight till the following morning at 10 o'clock uh, when the autopsy is actually done. And as a result, we, we now have, let's say, five to eight hours, maybe longer of a time lag between death and autopsy or when the blood is withdrawn from, from, the, from the body uh, for testing. And, uh, and, and, and during that time period is what is known as postmortem redistribution. And that means that basically the, the amount of drug, so even though the, the blood does not circulate, any blood that's that's any I'm sorry any drug that's in the blood can now equilibrate with its surrounding fat and other tissues and vice and go back and forth if you will to an equilibrium point. So so depending on the length of time between death and autopsy, you can have more equilibration, and therefore the the amount of a given drug in the in the blood can rise sometimes by three to five fold over that time period compared to what it was, let's say at the time of death. So there are books, for example, for many, for many drugs that, that tell you what that postmortem redistribution factor is. And uh, you use that information in your analysis and your testimony. Uh, but that's one of the issues about uh, the the time of death versus the time of autopsy, and then the postmortem redistribution uh, issue. Oh, okay, great. Uh, and just uh, Rafael just responded, and he said, uh, "Thank you." He says, uh, "Here in Brazil, the threshold is, is 0 0.6, uh, and uh, once it was used as a statement, when a CSI team took around nine hours to get to the scene, so still sounds like <laughs> a nice try, but not, yeah. not not good enough. Yeah, probably." Yeah. Um, so I, I want to, we're, we're getting on on time here. I just want to ask you about, um, well, first off, I, I am going to make sure that people know where to go to get the book. It was a really easy read, um, you know, nice to, uh, uh, you know, easy reading. It wasn't overly complicated, whatever. I thought it was a, a great read. So if anybody's interested, just go to forensicsfamouspeople.com. And my last question to you would be, um, you mentioned your next book and, um, uh, when when do you expect that to be out, and what else can you tell uh, us about the, the your your next book? So uh, so uh, for, uh, first of all, just to uh, clarify on my current book, it's also available on on your, any the online stores like Amazon or Barnes and Noble. <clears throat> the as far as my next book is concerned, um, I, I'm not quite sure which one I'm going to put out first. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm asking actually the viewers and uh, and other people who have bought my current book, but I, it seems like people seem to uh, want another nonfiction book. And uh, I, I started writing my fiction one, uh, uh, Murder at the Taj Mahal. Uh, I have a couple of ideas for nonfiction. Uh, one of them is uh, basically a review of, of uh, many of my cases. Uh, so this way I can explain you know, these will be different types of cases. Each chapter will be another case, uh, whether and, and the kind of drugs and what went into the analysis and and, and how the conclusions arrived. That would be uh, one type of book. Uh, another one is more about the uh, 
by biological and pharmacological differences between men and women. And, uh, and, and that was going to be called I'm Adam, You're Eve. Um, and basically describe uh, the differences that uh, besides sex uh, or gender, uh, what other differences we have that affect the pharmacological uh, differences between men and women, how, how men and women metabolize, analyze, uh, utilize uh, different drugs. That's so, okay. yeah, so I, I, I kind of was thinking of doing that one. So I'm not quite sure yet which one will be first, but, but I think uh, realistically, it's, we're talking about uh, two years away before the book will be published. Yeah, it's a heck of a heck of an endeavor either way. Uh, I mean, I, I have a hard enough time just trying to write papers. So I don't know how you would sit down and write a lengthy book. But uh, interestingly, I once heard something about left uh, medication and the way it applies to left handed versus right handed people or left brain versus right, uh, uh, right brain people. I thought, geez, that's interesting. I didn't think that that was even a thing. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that would uh, certainly be one, and uh, and then of course differences in weight, differences in height, uh, yeah. uh, differences in metabolism, age. You know, there are, lo there are a lot of different parameters that one can investigate, and obviously, as you can imagine, there's a lot of research involved here. And uh, but I think that I, I kind of like that. I, I like I like the idea of analysis and re research. So, uh, but I so I haven't quite decided yet which of the two books I'll I'll uh, this, I'll do first. But sooner or, later, sooner or later, I'll do one of both. All right, great. Well, look, um, I want to say thank you so much for being here. I'm just going to make a closing announcement. And uh, if you can hang back, don't don't hang up just yet. And uh, I'll, I'll chat with you just a little bit afterwards. But hey, thanks a lot for all the information. That was great. And hey, folks, if you're interested, again, uh, look it up, uh, Amazon or uh, forensicsfamouspeople.com. Uh, it's, it's a good book, good, good read and uh, well done. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. All right, folks. Well, that does it for this episode. Next week, we have Dr. Sherry Forbes. She's a professor, forensic chemist, and consultant who's the director of the First Human Taphonomy Facility in Canada. So you can join us as we discuss cadaver dogs, clandestine graves, and what it takes to start a body farm. So that does it for this episode. Thank you very much, and have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.